tuning for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Our guests waiting to be profiled are actress Hattie Winston and author Ellen Waterston. Actress Hattie Winston was born and raised in Mississippi. She went to high school in New York and studied voice at Howard University. Hattie, when you came out of Howard University, what did you expect to do? <laughs> I wanted to become the next Landine Price. She was my hero, uh, my heroine, my shero. Um, and uh, because she was from Mississippi, I thought, well, I can, I can have a shot at this. So that was really what I wanted to do. That Excuse was very me. heavy <laughs> duty, trying yes. to follow up to someone I like know, that. I know. I've always had <laughs> grand ambitions. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But, you know, the, the great thing is, you ended up on Broadway. Yes, I did. Right away. Yes, I did. Um, I was so fortunate because the area of New York that I lived in, I met uh, Robert Hooks. And uh, oh. he started a, a group for young people in my area called the Group Theater Workshop. And from that, I became a part of the Negro Ensemble Company. And well, you were a founding member of Negro Ensemble. Yes. How did you decide to yeah. start a, something well, like that? Well, when it says founding members, it means that I was, one of the, uh, I was one of the original members. There have been incredible actors that have come through the Negro Ensemble Company, but I was actually in the first, very first company. And it it started with the group theater workshop and with Robert Hooks, and then Douglas Turner Ward came aboard and Gerald Crone, uh, Crone came aboard. Didn't it seem funny, though, to start just a group of black actors? Didn't it feel like you were going to be too insular? Well, at the time, it, it, we felt that it was a magnificent idea because there weren't that many opportunities for us uh -huh. to do other things. And at that time, also, there was not in existence a professional uh, black company. Um, and so we wanted to be trained properly. We wanted, to, uh -huh. uh, we wanted to have all of the tools so that no one could say that you're not ready for broad Way. You're not ready to do these so-called classics. But these people that you were working with all came out of highly educated oh, yes, positions. yes, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, we wanted to do, as a matter of fact, the very first piece that we did at uh, the Negro Ensemble Company was a piece that was written by Peter Weiss, a German playwright, called mm -hmm. Song of the Lusitanian Bogey. And at that time, it was very revolutionary because we were dealing with colonialism and we were dealing with, with uh, colonialism in Africa. Uh -huh. And uh, so we had, um, we were doing classical pieces as what pieces as well as pieces that had not been done before. Well, that's great. Yeah. So you re you really were ready for Broadway, oh, yes. which was oh, Two yes. Gentlemen from Verona. Yes. Actually, the very first uh, play that I did on Broadway was a play called The Me Nobody Knows. You oh it was yes yes we well, did. Well, you it. must have been so young I was. and to be so. I was. Well, so talented to be there. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you. We did it. We started the piece off Broadway at the Orpheum Theater. The me in for the, the me. me nobody knows down on Second Avenue, and these producers came and they saw us kids and they loved it and they moved us to Broadway and that was my very first Broadway play. Oh, so you were really uh, old hat when you were doing Verona. I'm still not old hat. <laughs> You were experienced. Let's say that. I'm still learning, even <coughs> even today. Yeah, but in the meantime, all this time has passed. You've uh, acted, you've produced, you've directed, you've sung, you've what? I mean, you've just had your hand in everything. Well, I see myself as an artist, and I think as an artist. Um, you have to learn, and that was one of the things I learned at NEC, Negro Ensemble Company. I learned about uh, backstage, I learned about directing, mm -hmm. I learned about acting, I learned about, at, at NEC, it was, it was as if we were at university. You see, so we had to learn movement. We had to learn stagecraft. So we had to learn all of that, and 
I don't separate any of it. Uh, actually, I love performing. I, I, I don't think I'll ever stop love, love doing that. You've been in so many films and so many TV things, and Becker was a really big thing yes. for you. It is a really big yes. thing for yes. you because you won the NAACP Award for Best Image, yes. Image Award. Yes. Yes. How did that role work Well, for you? it's it, Becker was incredible. I'm most proud of it because originally when I went in and I had to do it like everybody else, I had to audition. But when I went in, it was so thrilling because I was there with every ethnicity. The part was oh. not written oh. for an African-American woman. Oh. It was just written for someone who was strong of character, someone who could be authoritative. For some reason, they thought I could be. <laughs> you've been, you've done a lot of TV. Yes, yes, but. Had there, you ever done a series? Yes, but I had never done a comedy series before. Oh, that's the yes, difference. Yes, yes. And I came, as a matter of fact, I came to Los Angeles to do Homefront, which was a period, a drama period piece. Ah. And that ran for two and a half seasons. And then uh, I did guest appearances on other TV shows. And then I auditioned for Becker for the role of Margaret. And I was there with uh, Latinos and Asians and Irish. And it was just exciting. You and were the strongest woman well, or the funniest woman. I, I ended up being the funniest woman. And I ended up getting the part. And I was just thrilled. That was a far cry from singing like Leontine Price. Yes, it was. It? Oh, yes. As a matter of fact, I've only just sung on Becker. Uh, oh. We just we just shot the episode uh, this past Tuesday. But you do produce with your husband yes. Harold. Yes. Um, Harold Wheeler. Harold Wheeler. We, we produce uh, he's a uh, Tony Award winner. He's, he's a an, uh, big winner of everything. <laughs> but you produce this onstage cabaret that yes. I think is so interesting. Yes, we're doing. See, I believe that there is so much talent in this town, and I have so many friends who come from theater who sing, <laughs> uh, who don't get the opportunity. There are some. There are some venues here, but they're certainly not the kind of venues that we're used to in New York. Of course. We we have um, the center grill here. But there's so many there's cabarets so in New York. Many, I so know. many. And so Harold and I, along with the Alex Theater, we're producing a series called Hattie and Harold's Onstage Cabaret. And we've had Sally Kellerman. People have forgotten that Sally Kellerman Sing. is an incredible singer. Mm. And she she recently performed for us. Frida Payne will be performing for us. Um, I you just performed. finished. Yes. yes, I just finished singing uh, uh, at the Alley. But tell us the concept. I think it's just incredible. Thank it's you. actually on, on stage. stage. <laughs> Hence the name on stage cabaret. I know, but you don't think about that. You think people are on stage singing, no. but the people the, sit on yes, stage. The yes. Guests the guests stage. are there. And what we did, the Alex, as you know, is uh, a historical uh, uh, landmark, the landmark, yes. landmark theater in Glendale. At, but what we did is we transformed the stage into the cabaret. So we bring tables and chairs onto the stage, and we build a stage on the stage. And we can get 250 people <gasps> on the stage, and we serve drinks as if you were in a cabaret cabaret setting. I have my ushers dressed like they were in the cabaret and they're serving you and we bring the band on the stage. I had three pieces. Sally had five pieces. So uh, are five you musicians. on a stage? I'm on, on a stage on a on stage. On a stage on a stage. And it's called Hattie and Harold's On Stage but Cabaret. You, I mean that sounds like a the uh, commercialism, but that you can take that all over the country I would as a love concept. To. I would love to. I would love to because there's so many talented people. And then when people come and see what we're doing, Frida came, I asked her, would she be interested? She says, yeah, simply because she knew me and she knew Harold. But then she came and she saw, you know, it's like, it's terrible, but if you build it, they'll come. Exactly. <laughs> but you know, there's so many stages that are left unused. I know. I know. That's why I think it's just such a great idea. Thank you. We're so excited. And then so you excited. can hear everything. Everybody can. And, but what's so incredible, because it is a theater, we have access to all the lighting that's oh, there. Yes, we have that's all right. the sound, the sound system that is there. So do they come in the front door? They come walk in the down front, the aisle. They walk down <laughs> the aisle and they come up on the stage. So they walk through the orchestra section. Yes. Yes. 
Yes. And then they feel like really important. Exactly. They walk through the orchestra section and then they, they enter and they're up on the stage and we make sure that we have beautiful flowers there. Oh. We make sure that we, we treat them well. We, we treat them as guests in our home and they love it. They just love it. Well, another thing that you've done, which is really with, with Harold, Wheeler, the great musician, yes, talented, <laughs> talented person, yes. is produced this play in New York called Nativity yes. once a year. Yes, we do it once a year. It's called Nativity, A Life Story. But what's unique about it is that uh, it's from Mary's point of view. Oh, yes. a woman's point a of view. A woman's, for some reason, <laughs> I have this idea. But it's from Mary's point of view. And my partner and I, James Stovall, who uh, co-wrote the piece with me, I also co-wrote it. Oh. And uh, uh, well, maybe that's why it's from Mary's point of view. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, we do it and we have these people that have been so committed. We started in this little theater. It used to be uh, a little theater on 100th Street and Broadway. And uh, it has grown and grown. We are now at the United Palace Theater. Um, and it's huge. Huge theater, 3,500 seater. We started huge. out with 75 seats, and now we've grown to 3,500 seats at the United Palace Theater. And we were reviewed last year by the uh, New York Times, and they said that um, Radio City Music Hall had nothing on us. So you have a, a very mixed audience, oh, it yes. must be. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And mixed. Uh, uh, we have a mixed cast, uh, but it's predominantly African American, but it's it's a mixed cast, and we have people that have been involved, like Felicia Rashad and Lilius White and Ebony Joanne and B.B. Wine. And they want to keep coming and back? And yes, <laughs> and they actually, believe it or not, every year they call us and say, what are the dates? Oh, because they want you to Stephanie call them. Mills <laughs> and, and Freddie Jackson, all these people who have wonderful, successful careers. But you have great Broadway singers yes. because it's in New York. Yes. You, have, you, you can get a whole of those yes. people and I know we that have, they're there. We have the Broadway Inspirational Choir. We actually mm -hmm. have a 150 voice choir that performs with us every year, Shirley Black Brown, who is our choreographer. We have incredible, incredible people. Well, you are doing that, you're writing, yes. you're producing, but you've also directed, you directed for Colored Girls yes. at the Ford Theater, yes. you directed the Amen Corner. Yes, yes. Uh, which do you like? Best? I love all of it. I just <laughs> love all of it. And I'm, I'm, thank you so much for mentioning um, uh, Colored Girls in Amen Corner. Because, you were in that. Yes, be, but it's another uh, venue that, I, uh, oh, that I've been right. involved with. It's called CCAP, which is Classic and Contemporary American Place. Again, it comes back to the fact that there are so many actors out here that want to be doing theater and they're not and you can if I can pick up a phone and Ed Asner will say yes I want to come and do your reading I want to come and do your play that's got to be significant well you have to do that I mean yes. that's part of what you have to yes. do now yes yes so um, before we leave, I know you've been in so many films too, and I think the best Jackie Brown, oh, and Beverly Hills Cop. Yeah, but yeah. What, True which? Crime with uh, Irene. See, now it's interesting. I did uh, True Crime with Clint Eastwood, and uh, I sat with him one day and I asked him, I said, how do you do all of these things? Because he writes, he directs, he's acting, he produces. I said, how do you do this? And he said to me, well, first of all, what I do is I surround myself with people who know what they're doing, uh -huh. and I let them do their jobs. So that's how he's able to produce and direct and star in his films. Um, and I, that was a great lesson to me, so that I came back and I was like, okay, if I surround myself, who knows music better than my husband? Oh, totally. Okay, so he gets to handle the music. I get to call up people and say, would you like to come and sing? Miss Social. Miss Social, <laughs> would you like to come and sing? And I also, I love doing business. So I enjoy oh. sitting at my desk and uh, making things happen. But Clint Eastwood's words were really great for you because yes. everyone you mentioned today is uh, is at the top of their field. Exactly, exactly. So I can pick up the phone and call Sally, Sally Kellerman and say, would you like to sing? 
at Hattie and Harold's on stage cabaret, and she, I was lucky because she said yes. Then I didn't have to worry about it anymore. Exactly. She would do her makeup. She would do her clothes. She, uh, exactly. Costumes, but then do I would make sure, and I do make sure that the artists that I bring in, that I take care of them. So, and I was so very proud because she called me and she said she'd never been treated the way that she was treated when she came to the Alex but Theater. But you like to be treated like exactly. that, so you do the same so, thing. So, just like you notice <laughs> I kept admi admiring your beautiful flowers, I think that Miss Kellerman should have beautiful flowers in her dressing room, so I make sure that. I make sure that uh, when she comes, whatever she needs backstage, it's there. I made sure that the place was clean. I made sure that she was taken care of. Things so that, that other uh, directors, producers exactly, don't think about. Exactly. Exactly. So my job as a producer is to serve my artists. But I think that's a woman's point of view, don't you? I, I mean, do. I think that's your eye. And also, probably, you're a Pisces. <laughs> <laughs> what else would a Pisces exactly. do? Exactly. And I love taking care of them. You know, I love, I, I, I love taking care of the artists that I want because I know, as an artist, if my surroundings are beautiful and I, I feel good, then when I go out on stage, I can yeah. give you 125%. And that's what you did today. Oh, thank you. And we you. thank you so much thank for being with us. Thank you for having us. me. Hattie Winston. And don't go away. We'll be right back with Alan Waterston. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. I'm with author Ellen Waterston, who's in town from Bend, Oregon. Ellen was born and raised in Boston. Her love of writing uh, has earned her four resident writing fellowships, and as a freelance journalist, she's written for a number of periodicals. Ellen is a graduate of Harvard University and the University of Madagascar. Why Madagascar? <laughs> well, I, I got a, a degree in archaeology, in primitive archaeology from the University of Madagascar in association with getting a Rotary Fellowship there. Is that right? Yes. And how long were you there? Where? It was a year. Where? Yeah. Where? And what kind of school is it? it well, it was a beautiful <laughs> university at the time in Tenerife, which was Tananarive at the time, uh -huh. and uh, was a lovely, a lovely situation and a lovely year. Did you, did you apply for that? Yes, I did. So you knew you were going, because it sounds so exotic, doesn't it? Well, and it was. <laughs> <laughs> um, you also have had a play produced, uh, besides all these other journals you've written for. I know as a journalist, um, your writing is based on fact. Yes. So uh, you've written a play which has been produced. What was uh, the theme of that? Well, I, one of the plays then segued into one of the children's books that I published. So oh. the play was uh, called Barney's Joy. It was a holiday theme play. Mm -hmm. And a second one was Grace Notes that was um, more to do with aging gracefully. So one was children and one was yes, <laughs> yes, older, both ends, older book men, ends, older people. Yeah, um, did you find? Did you base them on facts? I did indeed. the uh, The children's play was based on my son losing his favorite stuffed animal, oh. <laughs> and Grace Notes was based on the patience and love that my father showed my mother in her declining years. Uh, so everything that we're learning about your writing is really fact and not fiction. You've, you have written novels? I have, but I think they, they are generally structured around a factual event. I, um, I guess my imagination needs that uh -huh. to get started. Because I, I don't think I could ever write a novel. I can't make up a story because I have to have the facts in front of me and then write it from there. Well, and there's so many wonderful stories around us that exist in fact. <laughs> you have something else in, uh, in uh, Oregon called the Riding Ranch. What is that? That is an organization three of us started. We offer retreats and seminars for writers, and uh, mostly in the central Oregon area. The, the eastern part of Oregon is, is desert, 
And so we retreat out into the desert for about a week and uh, sometimes with master artists, sometimes just as a retreat. That sounds hard to believe. I, I, you were talking about desert when I was reading your bio and you said that you, I mean, it's almost like cowboys. Oh, indeed, yes. But, but in Oregon, it seems like it's wet all the time. Yes, there is that, that <laughs> perception that the western part of the state is very wet because the Cascade Mountains keep all the rain to the west of them. And then east of them, east of the Cascade Mountains, it's about 12 inches of rainfall a year. Is that right? Yeah. And so you have that desert type yes, of Yes, high right? desert it's called, yes. And what do you do there when you go on retreat? Well, we, we rent lodges that are very secluded, way out in the desert, so it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity for, for people to pull back and have some writing time that is uninterrupted. But do you teach classes? In some of the retreats we do, in some of the retreats we bring in master writers oh, you do. to help run workshops, and then in others, it's simply a retreat. And then, and then when you do the workshop, what, what do you focus on? Well, we're focusing on craft and we're focusing a, lo uh, a lot on people fitting their writing ambitions into the day job, so to speak. Oh. Helping, helping beginning writers oh, that's keep their promise to themselves. And how do they do that? Well, it's difficult. It's difficult. And, um, but uh, we help them develop a log. We have what we call a writer's log and that they can use on a daily basis to help structure that writing into their daily oh. regimen. So, so it's just a matter of fitting it in and doing it the same way every day. It really is. But then when you look at this paper, do you know where you're going to go from there? <laughs> How are you going to start writing? <laughs> well, you don't, but so long as you show up, it starts to, it starts to happen. Does it? Um, you also, I'm taking you all through the steps before we get to this book that you wrote, which is Then There Was No Mountain. Uh, you have a public relations firm in Oregon. That's true. I, uh, as, as as your listeners will learn should they read the book, I was a single mother for quite a long time and started a public relations business to support us. And it so were you writing freelance and doing public yes. relations at the same time? Yes. But yes. it's a natural fit, isn't it? It's a natural fit. And how do you get uh, clients? Well, it's, it's very regionally concentrated, my business is, and so they're, believe it or not, they're pretty much all in the central Oregon area. All your clients? Yes. Some of them are statewide and some are in California, Northern California, but very few. But what type of clients? It's mostly public, private sector to do with public policy, public information oh, campaigns. Oh, it is. It's more serious yes. rather yes. than uh, in the arts. Definitely, yes. Oh, so you have to have a different slant on writing and yes. different knowledge? Do you, um, yes. And do you have to research that or how do you do it? Yes. I mean, initially it was pretty uh, seat of the pants to get it going, but um, with more and more experience and more and more diversified clients, we've kept up with the learning curve. Well, tell us about uh, Then There Was No Mountain. It's well, a pretty, it's, a, it's, it's a journey. It's a journey. The subtitle is A Parallel Odyssey of a Mother and Daughter Through Addiction. I um, came west from, from New England with the dream of living the ranching west with the man that I was in love with, of raising a family with him. And ranching, that's and, where the ranching came in. And ranching, yes. You knew about that. You knew there was a ranch area there. Yes. And um, it all looked like it was off to a grand start, but I began to realize that there was something terribly wrong in our relationship and with him, and it turned out that my husband had um, developed an appetite for drugs. But and not, you didn't see it right away. I didn't see it right away. I mean, right you were away. married a long time. I was married a long time, and when I did figure it out, the children and I left. And that's sort of the backstory for the book. Uh, I think that my children, in response to that situation, have reacted in a variety of ways. And in, in terms of my youngest daughter, uh, she basically chose to kind of numb herself about this situation with her father. And I decided that I had to take some action when I saw that she was really spiraling downward. And so this is the story, on the surface of things, it's, it's the story of intervening on her and sending her to a wilderness therapy program. But as a journalist, you're used to dealing with facts. You're used to dealing with other people's facts. You have to tell a personal story. I mean, really personal story. How did that uh, affect you and how were you able to do it? Well, I was able to do it because I, I really strongly believe that when bad things happen, they can boss our lives around unless we figure out a way to shape them, reshape them into something useful, if not beautiful, for ourselves, 
for our own healing and hopefully for others. And how uh, did you get her to do what you wanted her to do? How did you get her to boot camp? How did you get her to this wilderness therapy? It was an intervention. I took her there. I took her there. And, and left her? And left her. And she subsequently then went on to another program, but it was at that point that I realized that I had addictions of my own, which were behavioral, but nevertheless functioned just like any good drug. Guilt, shame, denial, the slow reaction time, impaired judgment, so distort you had, reality. You had to face all those. I had to face and my own. And put those in your book. And put them in my book and let people know that it's one thing to look at a kid's issue, but it's really, really critical that parents look at their own. Are there situations where you can look at them and just blame everybody else around you? Well, I don't think we can get away with it <laughs> as much as we'd like to. And how is that child now? Wonderful. She's wonderful, bright, engaged in life. She, she, it's as close to a happily ever after as I think we're well, permitted you, in this but life. But you remarried. Did I that, did, did I that did. have a uh, kind of a... Yes, it has a positive influence, I believe, to kind of reconfigure in a healthy way. How intense was writing this book for you? Very intense, very intense. It, it uh, is, as I say, it was a healing process for me, and I think in its honesty, hopefully will allow people to, to be, be free to their own story, feel free about talking about it, and open them to their own, to their own healing. Do you have any other problems we're going to read about in the next book? <laughs> I think I'm thinking about a really funny novel. Oh, that sounds Let's good. <laughs> a novel, so you can just use some of the funny things you've heard. <laughs> oh, so are you going to continue living in Oregon? I am. I am. It's a beautiful part of the world, and I enjoy visiting the East Coast where I'm from regularly, but I, I like Oregon, and it is my home. Well, we're so happy that you came, and the, I, I've... Re I started reading and I haven't read it all, but it is just flowing and written so well. Thank you. Of course, because you've had these uh, fellowships and you do teach a reading class, writing class, you know what to do, and I think you you can win the reader over. Well, thank you very much. So thank you, Ellen Waterston, for being here and bringing her book, Then There Was No Mountain. And thank you for watching the Joan Quinn Profiles. And keep writing to 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, Los Angeles, 90017.